This is called the corner of Paris and Porter. The corner of Paris and Porter. Meet me there. You remember the corner of Paris and Porter. We stood on that spot after walking our city all day, dropped off the earth, lost each in the other. We'd live in the house there, we said. We loved the sway back porch, the elms in the yard towering. We stopped in the thick, still shade of one, the sidewalk raised and cracked by its roots. On the curb, a mailbox, a gape, flag up, a dry bird bath in the yard, and in the driveway, a yellow car. This was lucky, a yellow car, a child once told me. The sunlight, a wall slamming down outside the shade circle. Two old sisters, we guessed, lived there, two lace antimacassars on two wicker porch chairs. We'd knock on the door, tell them we loved their house, which they'd then bequeath to us on the corner, the house we found by chance, chirps and child calls, the clanking of lunch dishes, though we saw not one child or bird. The mailman, we never saw him either, but knew his name was Steve, would leave great piles of letters the grocery and the garden would provide. It was the corner of Paris and Porter and that part of the city where we'd never walked before. It was south and farther south, past downtown, beyond the meat district, the fish market, past the street of clocks, the tripe stalls, the brick kilns, the casket factories. We turned east a few blocks north. There was nothing but warehouses and long blocks of lots, tall fences topped by barbed wire, behind which what? We walked over a bridge, the train tracks beneath were thick with weeds, and there it was, a neighborhood, houses, yards, shrubs. We were talking and talking, I don't know how many miles, lost in each the other. And though we did not know where we were, we knew where we were going, the corner of Paris and Porter. Remember, the day was blue and clear. I recall the exact path of an ant, the mica glinting in the curbstone, a curtain parting momentarily at your laugh. I could have drowned in your hair. Meet me there today. Don't be late on the corner of Paris and Porter. I want to read a few poems from this uh, new book that will be out maybe in about a month. Nowadays, you get what they call bound galleys, and uh, that's what it is going to look like, roughly. It's almost like the finished uh, paperback uh, book. Dry bite, this is called. A dry bite is when a, a snake or a venomous creature bites you, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, there's no venom. They don't loose any uh, venom, which would mean that would be a lucky, uh, a lucky day. <laughs> And there's a kind of snake mentioned uh, in the first line of this poem uh, called a crate, K-R-A-I-T. It's a very small but one of the world's uh, deadliest snakes. Dry bite. When the crate strikes but does not loose his venom, dry bite. What makes the snake choose not to kill you? Not please, not I didn't mean to step on you. He may be fresh out, struck recently someone else. But if he withholds his poison, when does he do so and why? Can he tell you are harmless to him? He can't swallow you, so why kill you? There's no use asking the crate. He's deaf. In that chemical, that split billionth of a second, he decides and the little valve of his venom sac stays shut or opens wide. Dry, oh dry, dry bite. Lucky the day you began to wear the crate's snake-eyed mark on your wrist and you walk down the mountain into the valley of that which remains of your life. That would be a lucky day. There's a young poet in California uh, whose work I like, and his name is Brendan Constantine. And he was just telling a story about his childhood a couple of years ago. 
and he said something that I immediately wanted to steal and, and use uh, for a poem. So I asked his, his permission, uh, and he said, sure, if I dedicate the poem to him. So uh, it's, uh, what he had said was, uh, on his first report card in the for kindergarten, uh, the comment, one of the comments the teacher wrote was, can tie shoes, but won't. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I could relate to that. A lot of poets I know could relate to that. So I'm not imagining this guy in particular, uh, Brendan Constantine, but a, a, a person like this. Can tie shoes, but won't. It said on his report card, five years old, the boy so slung against the river's current, he was later lost in his paper canoe, paddled himself lost or half lost or less lost than most, not in the mid-river flotilla with all the other boats fighting the main and churning current, but instead along and beside and even under the river's banks, the place of overhangs and eddies, sloughs and whirlpools, the shaded place beneath the bug brailed leaves, the python laden branches, the place beneath the bank's cool clay, between the roots where the toothy creatures cache their prey for later. Did he travel always on one side of the river? No. Did he cross? How did he cross to the other side? carefully, cutting the current without fighting it, giving up some distance to it in order that just so the shade, the light, the slight undulations of the river's bends are changed with intention. And for years, upstream, a lifetime this way, upstream he goes, this way, upstream on his voyage. The kid turned out okay, that kid, Brendan Constantine, he turned out okay. 